Okay, right. So just want to check everybody can see that okay, or just shout if you can't. Um, uh, well, thanks, Ruth. Um, uh, I was I came along to uh, one of these um, uh, towards the end of the uh, the summer term, and uh, I sort of I don't know whether I got my arm twisted or whether I volunteered, but anyway, um, I, I find it quite convenient to to do occasional presentations based around my thesis um, because it gives me a goal to try and get to a certain point with what I'm um, trying to write at the time. So this is quite a nice sort of convenient point. Um, I'm going to talk today about um, the, the research setting that I've used for my uh, PhD uh, data collection. Uh, so less really about the, um, the, the thesis its, uh, itself. Um, and actually this particular question that I'm going to answer today in today's session uh, isn't really a research question in my, uh, in my thesis, but I will want to say something about this at the, uh, at the end when I'm doing my write-up, um, even though it's not my, my main research question. Um, so it's quite quite nice because I've been uh, looking at my first uh, uh, lesson study um, over the last recent weeks um, and and getting something written up about that. So and um, this is what I'm going to talk about um, today. I'll do a, a brief overview of the doctoral study. Um, maybe while I'm just talking for a few moments, you might like to just type in the chat why you why you're here. That that's quite helpful for me. When we get to the end, I can just have a look, look through and and just see that um, it's uh, uh, whether whether. I've hit the mark for you um, or not as well. Um, so yeah, I'll introduce the doctoral study and um, uh, talk a little bit about um, the, the, the different options I had with regards to using lesson study um, as, as my research setting. Um, and then finally, I'll take you through um, uh, some outcomes from the first lesson study um, that I conducted with my um, participants um, and uh, then just sort of conclude by reflecting on some of the, um, the, the strengths and challenges um, that I experienced um, and thinking about this as a, a, an, as a model for professional learning outside of a research setting as well. Um, Okay, I'm um, just to say as well, I, I have sort of uh, put a couple of slides in just to pause at the end of uh, section two, um, uh, section one and section two, um, just in case anybody wanted to ask anything, particularly in terms of clarification. Um, but if you have any sort of bigger questions for us to discuss at the end, which I'm hoping you will, because that will help me in my doctoral work as well, um, then we can save those um, for the end of the session. Okay, so um, starting with the context, um, uh, I just want to sort of uh, look back to 2016 um, when we uh, started to see the, um, the, the introduction to um, Teaching for Mastery, which was uh, led by NCETM and the maths hubs were just in their infancy at this stage. We'd had a new national curriculum implementation in 2014. Um, and so a lot of my work as a teacher educator with primary in-service teachers was addressing these early ideas about um, teaching for mastery, what that might mean. There were certain new pieces of language being banded about um, and trying to unpick what that might mean in the context of um, our classrooms in England. Um, uh, alongside that, I also have when I've spent time in classrooms, not only in my own classroom, um, but in other teachers' classrooms, I'm always quite interested in the choices of examples that teachers um, uh, make um, when they are teaching. Um, and in particular, those on the hoof um, examples um, contrasted with uh, very carefully designed um, and thought through examples uh, and how they're actually used in the classroom. So what is it that the teachers actually do with the task in order to um, uh, use that as an experience for their pupils. And so my, my research interest very quickly um, uh, started to focus in on um, uh, variation, um, uh, which of course is, is very well spoken about now and, and is used all of the time. Um, I, I'll, I'll come to that in a, in a, in a moment. Um, and I 
I suppose when I read up about variation and I thought more about um, variation um, and how this is going to translate into our classrooms in England, um, uh, the, the, the one that struck me as being probably most attached to our existing practice um, was thinking about procedural variation um, and in particular um, one problem, multiple changes. Um, so. Um, uh, Gu and also Sun have um, tried to categorize different types of procedural variation in, in their literature. Um, and so you have these three types. So type one is one problem, multiple changes, type two, one problem, multiple solutions, and type through three, multiple problems, one solution. And, and in each of those have um, uh, plenty that we could get our teeth into, but actually where I wanted to start from was, was something that I felt I had been intuitively doing in my classroom, but without it being deliberate practice. Um, and um, Sun refers to the fact that actually in classrooms in China, procedural variation um, is very much part of their indigenous practice. It's, it's as much about picking up um, a, a mini whiteboard and, and having a, a, a pen um, to write on um, uh, as it is in English classrooms as, as using procedural variation is in um, uh, Chinese classrooms. And so it, it's almost unspoken about as a, as a pedagogical practice because it is part of their indigenous culture. So one problem, multiple changes um, involves um, trying to discern some sort of structure in a series of very similar calculations. And the craft is to try and create an experience that helps to illuminate that structure. And so using the language of procedural variation, um, we might look at the first example and um, name that um, the example that we would hope, in, and I'm using that in the context of this, this sequence, that that would be my starting point. I'm making an assumption that when I'm going to use this procedural variation sequence, that the pupils already understand and know how to solve equation A. And from that, that's my anchoring point of knowledge. From the anchoring point of knowledge, I then ultimately want them to be able to have a way of solving the equation um, for 360 by something equals 2.5. And so that I've got to create a journey for them. And um, Gu calls that the potential distance. So from the anchoring point of knowledge to the end point, we're creating a potential distance. Now, Gu will say that the, um, uh, the, the, the further the distance, the more challenging um, the experience will be. Um, and the shorter the distance, um, the, the more um, uh, or the, the, the easier the, the experience will be. So as a teacher, you're then determining how, how far is that journey going to be for my pupils? Um, and, and you make that decision yourself. So I was obviously having to think of hypothetical pupils when I was designing this particular task. Um, and then the potential distance is then sort of backfilled with um, a, a selection of alternative equations, um, which hopefully create some sort of stepping stone. Um, and in the language of procedural variation, that's described as Poudian. And um, in the literature, you might see Poudian being um, uh, compared to scaffolding, um, it's, um, uh, it, but it, when you read into it a little bit more, it, it, it does separate from how we perceive scaffolding to be. Um, it's, it's more a ladder that we're climbing than scaffolding being some sort of um, something that is gradually being taken away. Here we're just sort of incrementing um, through, the, um, uh, through the sequence. So we've got this language of procedural variation um, that, that um, is centred around the design of, of these types of tasks. Um, in another situation, I'd have given you all the chance to have a play with this and, and uh, see what you experienced and what you noticed, but I'm, I'm not going to give you that experience at this particular moment in time. Um, so once you've got this sequence, then actually what we're wanting to do is to use this with um, pupils um, and help them to, to explore what's staying the same, what's changing, 
And um, Watson and Mason described that process as, as micro modeling. So that process of trying to see structure and exploit regularities in the experiential data. And that experiential data is, is being generated by the children actually having to solve those problems in sequence as well. Um, something uh, that, that, that my own thesis is, is looking at, which I won't talk about today, is actually, you know, do we just give the children the sequences that the, the, the equation is already solved? and then spend time looking at the patterns and the relationships and the structures from that. Um, and I'll ha you'll have to come along to some other talk to, to hear about why, why I'm thinking about that. Um, and um, so this, this idea of one problem, multiple changes also connects with the literature that we know from the West. Um, with a, a really um, a striking paper that I read, um, uh, written by Anne and John, um, uh, which um, I, is, is, is on open access, and I, I highly recommend it to anybody if you haven't read that particular paper, which um, is in effect uh, talking about one problem, multiple changes, um, type procedural variation, but in the, in the language that, that Anne and John um, talk about mathematical learning. So in terms of why is this important for my uh, doctoral work, well, I was obviously identifying a particular gap that I felt was um, uh, emerging here um, in, in the literature, that most of the literature about um, variation, um, uh, Chinese variation, of course, is embedded within the, the, the literature um, from China. Um, and that although it's an indigenous practice in China, um, we are now using this terminology in our classrooms in England where it isn't an indigenous practice. So for that, we, we will need somehow to um, work with teachers um, such that it becomes part of their practice here. Um, we also, as I referred to a few minutes ago as well, about this idea of, of variation now being very much referred to by teachers. Um, I hear, hear people talking about the variation um, as though it's, it's a something that we talk about. Um, and actually, I, I, but I also sense that it's, it's a very nebulous um, uh, uh, concept. Um, amongst teachers, we hear, um, you know, what one teacher calls variation isn't necessarily what another is. And, and so therefore, I, mean, I think that's, that's a big issue that we're dealing with here at the moment, that variation is actually such a massive, um, uh, massive idea in terms of task design and pedagogy, um, that it's very difficult to capture it in, in something um, uh, uh, with, with just a small definition of words. Um, when you look back through the literature, there, there's some interesting stuff that does exist in the context of um, teachers in, in England, uh, in particular, uh, Tim Rowland's work, um, where he, in, in his Knowledge Quartet work, he, he was looking at um, how um, the choice of examples was um, really fascinating from um, pre-service teachers, um, and in particular, this, this situation that we find ourselves often in um, choosing an on the hoof example um, where we end up obscuring the role of the variable. It makes it really hard to talk about the variation because we suddenly find ourselves doing things that uh, we do as a teacher. We, we think of something off the top of our head. So a coordinate that we want to start with, let's think of coordinate one, one. Okay, well, that's really, that's really difficult because it's hard for us to separate which is X and which is Y. Or uh, let, let, let's do nine divided by three. And then you suddenly dis discover that your divisor is going to be the same value as your quotient and you, you, you then can't separate the, the threeness um, of, of, those, um, of those digits. So that's what Tim Rowland talks about in terms of obscuring the role of the variable. Um, and, and finally, um, I think the reason why I felt the procedural variation, other than it connecting with my own practice and the things that I see teachers doing in the moment, um, it also was something that, that I felt... Um, uh, from from the work of, of, of Anne Watson and John Mason, that they that they they felt that it was actually the opportunity to do something quite interesting with a set of apparently mundane equations. So we're we're enhancing that experience of, of practice here. Um, that that we've got this opportunity to make practice more purposeful um, and interesting. So I was sort of led to think then. Well, okay, this is sort of out there, what, where, where do we move next in terms of um, uh, engaging uh, our existing in-service teacher workforce um, 
to, to, to think about these particular issues. Um, so I'm then sort of thinking about my research questions now, of course, back in 2016, um, my research questions didn't look anything like the ones I'm going to show you now, and they've taken various um, iterations and uh, reduced, and uh, I, I'm now down to pretty much where I think it's going to be. Um, uh, I don't think there's going to be any more changes now. So I'm, I'm interested um, uh, in, in thinking about the considerations that teachers give to the design and redesign of one problem, multiple changes, procedural variation sequences. Um, so this is about design. So teachers designing together. Um, and how do teachers construct the pedagogy? So not only do we have the task, but actually then what do we do with that task when we move it into the classroom with a, a class of, of pupils? What is our role as a teacher um, in the, um, uh, the use of these, these particular tasks? Um, so I then have to sort of think of it about what's my research setting going to be? If I'm going to answer these kinds of questions, uh, then I'm, I'm going to need a, a a really useful research setting. So before I go on to, to talk about that, um, I just want to give anybody a, an opportunity to just ask any clarification questions that maybe um, I hadn't uh, made clear um, in that first part of the presentation. If not, I'll move on. Okay, well, that's, that's a positive thing. Um, Okay, so um, thinking about um, the research setting then, so my, my choice was um, that I was going to be in a, a situation where I was going to be able to collect my data um, uh, through the work of a um, DfE funded, um, uh, what they now call an innovator, a, a a research and innovation work group at the time they were just an innovation work group I think um, and so I, I was able to get funding um, uh, courtesy of London South East Maths Hub um, to conduct uh, a work group where we were going to focus on the design and teaching of procedural variation tasks um, and I designed that based on some other models that I'd also used previously um, I had actually run a, a similar um, project um, the previous year for um, uh, uh, Kent and Medway um, hub as well. So this was going to be my research setting. Um, my research questions were already formed. I'd got all the ethics approved for, for my PhD. Um, and um, I, I then designed uh, based on my previous knowledge of, of, of how to construct these kinds of um, uh, events, um, a professional de development day. So everybody came together for the first time from different schools. They'd never met one another before. Um, it was a day to get to know one another, to experience variation for the first time, to get to to know a little bit about their professional backgrounds, how familiar they were with variation, um, how contextualized it was in terms of teaching for mastery, um, and, um, uh, and then to sort of help them to understand how we were going to do the operational side of setting up the lesson studies in their respective schools. So the participants were um, uh, going to be hosting lesson studies in, in their own um, settings, and we were all gonna descend on one individual host teacher. Um, and then I um, uh, explored with them what micro teaching lesson studies looked like. And the intention had been um, that we were going to, to do three lesson studies, uh, sorry, five lesson studies. Um, they were all set up. The first one was in December 2019. Um, the second one was the second week of March, 2000, uh, sorry, the third one was the second week of March in 2020, and I probably don't need to write the end of the story for you, um, but uh, we, we, in the end, ended up only having three um, lesson studies. In actual fact, um, given the, the amount of data that I've now got, um, uh, I, I think that, that that was a sort of blessing in, in some respects, that um, I've, I've got substantial data out of three lesson studies. Um, uh, to be able to start to uh, to be able to answer those those two research questions. 
Okay, so micro teaching lesson study is where I want to explore um, uh, for the, the next part of the, of the session. And I just, just need to look at the time because I'm conscious that I'm one of those people that does talk an awful lot and then never gets to the big points. Um, okay, that's, that's fine for me at the moment. Um, so and what I want to do now is just to sort of explore for those of you who may not be so familiar with the um, uh, with the, um, the stage of lesson study. Um, I can see we're going to end in 10 minutes, so we'll have to rejoin, I think, Ruth, by the looks of that. So if everybody's got their link available um, so that they can get back into the meeting room when the, um, uh, when, when the uh, uh, session closes. Um, okay, so um, I'm going to talk a little bit about how I arrived at micro teaching lesson study as being my um, research setting for a professional development experience. Um, so I think probably the most, um, most of us know the terms lesson study as a professional learning um, uh, uh, a vehicle um, originating in uh, East Asia. Um, it's been widely practiced in Japan and, uh, and China for um, several decades. Um, and we know that the, the research literature has uh, shows us now that lesson study has spread um, internationally and, and is taking on different forms as a result of that. Um, and and as, as such, we, we end up with um, uh, very different looking structures that are all being referred to as lesson study. Um, I'm gonna talk briefly about three different interpretations um, of lesson study. Um, uh, and so that you can sort of see how they have um, changed as they've left East Asia and moved into um, other, other parts of the world. So um, one particular um, type of lesson study, which is actually called learning study, um, is, um, uh, is used in, um, or was developed in Sweden um, and was, ha has been led by Ferenc Martin and his colleagues there. And Ferenc Martin, um, you may be familiar with if you've um, read the, the seminal paper from 2004 with um, Ling Yuan Gu about variation pedagogy. Um, and Ferenc Martin developed back in the 1990s this variation theory of learning. Um, and so I'm not going to go into any details about that today because it's a very different shape of theory, very different set of terminology. Um, and again, I hear people saying I'm using variation theory in my lessons when they don't actually use any of the language associated variation uh, theory at all. Um, and it's, it, it, it's an, another sort of situation where you, you've got this, this terminology being used without the, the clear understanding of it. And less so the, the difference here being that lesson study, the, the tasks are designed with variation theory of learning um, uh, at, the, at the foundation. Um, micro teaching lesson study um, is um, uh, what I take hybrid from and was uh, talked about and written about by uh, Fernandez. Um, but where um, Fernandez has focused on um, using this uh, for pre service uh, teacher development um, and also not in live classrooms. So it's done in um, uh, in university-based or initial teacher education-based uh, environments. So the, the, the teachers are, or the pre-service teachers are um, teaching to their peers um, rather than to uh, groups of pupils. And then we have Chinese lesson study, um, which is uh, an, an iterative approach to um, lesson study um, and underpinned by um, a, a, a analytical framework um, called quaternary analysis, which I'll come back to uh, shortly. Um, so um, let's just go forwards a little bit and think about Japanese lesson study, just so that we can sort of understand what's the same and what's different. Um, so in Japanese lesson study, um, you have a single research lesson. Um, the research lesson will have been collaboratively designed by expert teachers over a, a, a big and extended time scale and potentially influenced by um, a previous lesson study um, uh, the previous year. 
Um, it focuses on a single and complete lesson. Um, and the focus for Japanese lesson study is, is problem solving strategies predominantly. Um, the professional learning setting is um, also important to know because that's also what, how, what separates um, these, these different types of lesson studies. So you will have an expert teacher um, referred to as the knowledgeable other. Um, there will be a detailed lesson plan the teachers will observing will observe the whole lesson. They will have had an opportunity to um, explore the lesson plan in advance and give some considerations to um, the sorts of misconceptions that pupils might have um, ex might experience when they're working on the lesson, um, and uh, that will then be referred back to later on um, in the post lesson discussion, where the teacher who was teaching the lesson will have given a summary um, and then other teachers may give comments and then the expert teacher who has coordinated the um, lesson study together um, will um, provide a, a summary of, of key learning points um, for um, uh, the development of, of that particular lesson. Um, in learning study, um, again, we deal with a single and complete lesson. Um, and as I said previously, that's with a focus of variation in theory of learning. Um, and the professional learning setting, again, will have an expert teacher. There'll be a detailed lesson plan, which will have been designed by the teachers who are actually attending the lesson study, um, the learning study, um, and a part of that professional learning community. One member of that professional learning community will be elected to um, uh, teach the lesson study lesson, while the rest of the teachers observe. Um, what's happening and then a post lesson discussion um, will inform uh, uh, the reflections of the observing teachers, thinking about specifically the patterns of variation, which is part of um, the, um, uh, the variation theory of learning um, uh, framework. Um, and then there will be um, an iterative approach to redesigning the task and a new detailed lesson plan written, and then the teachers will come together again, maybe a month or so later, and another teacher will teach to her class um, or his, his or her class um, uh, the revised lesson. And that might that, that cycle might be repeated three or four times um, until they feel as though they're, that they're, they're reaching that point where the, 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 the task is meeting the intended um, learning outcomes. Chinese lesson study differs from the other two in that the, 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 the process of, of Chinese lesson study is about developing an exemplary lesson. Um, and so that, that notion of let's keep improving it, let's keep improving it until there, there's no possible deviation from um, uh, what we're intending the pupils to learn. So the professional learning ses setting again is lots of people brought together, uh, teachers brought together. It's usually led um, by university um, with academics as well as maths educators and teachers um, of varying experiences and, and they form a teacher research group and we, we use this language of TRG in, in, the, in England now um, but it is very different in makeup from um, the teacher research groups that, that we have that we see in China and they would collaboratively improve the practice of one teacher. So where in learning study, we saw different teachers in, their, in the, the learning community getting the opportunity to improve their practice. And in Japanese lesson study, the, the, the improving of practice of one teacher is not the goal. Um, it's the improvement of the, the lesson design. Um, we, we've got one teacher who is going to benefit um, from this exemplary lesson design lesson study but the other teachers are also going to benefit because they're contributing their own uh, reflections and thoughts as well. Again, initial detailed lesson plan um, is involved in this. Um, the teacher will teach um, uh, the, the, the first lesson designed by the first uh, a teacher who's the focus of the of the lesson study um, and then um, sh that teacher will be observed there'll be a post lesson discussion um, you see reflections uh, are based around a key point critical point and difficult point and then reflecting on the learning effect overall um, based on those those experiences um, what happens then is that the plan is redesigned um, by the collaborative group for the focus teacher 
and then that te same teacher will reteach on a different occasion and again that cycle will be repeated and one of the important features of, of the Chinese lesson study, and I think this might be um, related also to the Japanese lesson study, is an expectation that the research lesson is written up and published in an academic journal as well. Um, so finally, um, in terms of the research literature on different teaching uh, lesson study, we find Fernandez here talking about pre-service teacher preparation. So um, what, where micro teaching lesson study so carrying on, carrying on with micro teaching lesson study then. So we have pre-service teacher education setting this time, which is where the research literature has, has um, addressed um, uh, micro teaching lesson study. Um, so it's coordinated by uh, an expert teacher educator. So in a university setting or in a teacher, uh, initial teacher education setting, and it's conducted over a compressed time scale. So the other, um, uh, lesson studies that we, we've talked about um, may, may cover a, a three, three to six months, whereas this will be um, a much uh, smaller time period. And also um, that the, um, the time scale will um, uh, actually focus on a, a lesson segment. So we're not talking about a whole lesson here now, as we have been in the previous three examples. We're looking at one particular thing um, that might occur in a single lesson and uh, deal with that as a, as a teaching issue. Um, we have um, uh, the, the teaching is, um, sorry, I, my children have just come home and decided to make lots of noise outside. So I'm now somewhat distracted. Um, the, um, uh, the, the tasks are collaboratively designed um, by the pre-service teachers, and then um, a, a pre-service teacher is chosen to role play um, to uh, the teacher role, um, and their peers are role playing the, um, the role of, of, of pupils or students. There would also be a post-lesson discussion um, guided by the expert teacher educator um, and a discussion about the learning experience, suggestions for improvement and a second iteration and further iterations may be decided and retaught as well. So we've got this cyclical, iterative uh, nature to this. So what I really wanted to do was to try and sort of pull some of the all, all the useful bits that I saw in, in each of those different models into something that was workable for, for me, as I saw the use of procedural variation sequences, not as a whole lesson, but as part of a lesson um, uh, that may be focusing on fluency and, and for a teacher to determine which part of that lesson for, at the beginning or the end it, it might be used. It, it was almost arbitrary. It was just about it being a segment of a lesson. Um, so where we went from there was um, for me to sort of create my own hybrid model. So um, my hybrid model involved um, it being hosted by me. So um, uh, sorry, it hosted by a, a teacher um, from the uh, community of teachers that I was working with. Um, I'll talk a little bit about the participants and, and how they were selected in a, in a moment. Um, and um, then I took on the role as expert teacher educator, um, that knowledgeable other. Um, and each lesson study um, was compressed into um, two and a half hours. And within that two and a half hours, we conducted three cycles um, of, uh, of, an, of, of, uh, of, of iterations of the task. Um, and um, the lesson segment um, uh, was focus is, focuses on that issue and that issue being um, uh, how to uh, design a procedural variation task around a particular theme that the host teacher has identified. Um, we all collaboratively designed, so I took on the role of researcher and co-collaborator um, as well. Um, uh, although I was expert teacher, I mean, that's an issue that I'll come to at the end as well, um, how I sort of managed that, that, that role, which was quite, quite difficult at times. Um, but we would co-design um, uh, the, the lesson episode, the sequence, and think about the teaching that was involved. And then uh, one of the teachers um, would then teach um, uh, to a group, just a group of children. So again, we're not talking about a whole class. We're talking about a small group of children that have um, been identified by the host teacher um, to participate. And we tried wherever possible to make sure that those groups of children were a representative uh, um, 
uh, representative of the range of attainment that you might find in a typical um, unsetted primary classroom for that year group. Um, we then have the post lesson discussion, um, again, discussing the learning experience, comparing it and contrasting it with what we intended it to, hoped it would, would give the pupils the experience of, um, make suggestions for improvement, and then we would agree a second iteration of the sequence um, and, and how that might be handled um, in the classroom with a new group of pupils. And we conducted that as a cycle three times. So uh, my hybrid model looks a little bit like this. So we have a, a task design, which we design collaboratively. Um, we have about 20, 20 minutes of that um, before we move to the lesson episode. Um, and the structure for each lesson study was that I would always teach as expert teacher the first um, cycle based on what we had designed collaboratively and then um, uh, the second teacher would be a teacher who uh, wasn't hosting um, uh, and then the third teacher would be the host so the third teacher gets the benefit of the previous two, two iterations and sh uh, she or he is working with with pupils from his or her own classroom. Um, so the lesson less episode would last about 25 minutes and then we would have the post lesson discussion, which you will see was a very short period of time compared with maybe um, other lesson study models. Um, and again, that, that's something to be uh, aware of when I come to reflect uh, on this uh, later. Right. Again, I'm just going to have a look at timing. OK. So I have gone over in terms of time. So I do want to, to rush through this uh, bit very quickly. So I had eight teachers. They were convenience and sampled. So the teachers elected to participate. Um, uh, and then each host teacher identified six to eight uh, mixed prior attaining pupils. And three groups of those uh, were used in each lesson study. Um, OK, so. Um, the overall study involves three um, case studies of, of lesson studies, um, and I'm going to focus on the very first case study um, now as, a, as an example. Um, so the context um, for the first uh, lesson study was that it was the first one, and it was the first time that the teachers had participated in any kind of lesson study before. Um, and it was also the first time that we'd actually come together to operate um, in this way. We'd had the professional de development day, but this was the first time we'd worked together in this way. Um, we had the host teacher, Jenny. This is, they're all pseudonymized um, uh, names. And she was a very experienced teacher, as you can see. And she'd chosen the topic for her year six class um, that was dividing fractions by whole numbers. And we had an email exchange um, in the lead up to the lesson study day to arrive at that um, focus. And we also agreed on a prototype example, the type of problem um, that we um, imagined could be the starting point, that sort of anchoring point of knowledge that I referred to earlier in the slides. Um, and um, we started off with our before lesson um, discussion. So we looked at the prototype example um, and the teachers had to go at solving it. And then I asked them to think about what they um, noticed from the problem, what's available to be noticed. Um, and I also um, uh, use my in my role as expert teacher, uh, representing how that equation could um, appear as a pictorial and a concrete representation. Um, and then we co collaborated and co designed our first sequence, um, which uh, looked like this. Now, bearing in mind that this is all very new to all of us, so in this particular cycle, um, I probably had, a, well, I, I did have a, a greater influence in the decisions um, that, that were made around um, the, the design of the task. But at the same time, I also didn't want to. Um, not allow the teachers to make mistakes um, or errors or, or things that, that, that could potentially go wrong. Um, and the, the other thing that we did each time was to identify um, a sort of generalization that we wanted the pupils to um, uh, work towards, which is when the numerator and the divisor are the same, the numerator will be one. Now, that this doesn't make much sense in some ways, but this is what we had collaborated um, to, to create. OK, so then um, the lesson cycles were, were video recorded using Iris Connect, which is an online platform um, 
for videoing um, classrooms. It enabled two cameras to be used, one focused on the groups of pupils and one focused on the teacher and the flip chart that was used. And you can see there in the photograph that we've got children sat around a table uh, with some uh, a quiz and air available. And then the teachers are sat around the perimeter of the room um, so that they can observe what's happening um, simultaneously. So we had this sequence um, and the, the structure of the teaching episode, which lasted, lasted about 25 minutes, um, uh, was to get the children to observe the equations, um, try and encourage the children to talk about the features that they noticed, um, things that were same and things that were different about those equations. And then they were given that opportunity to solve the equation. So um, without any direct uh, teaching, um, the pupils were asked to have a go at finding the solutions, finding the quotients to these three equations. Um, from that, the teacher collected the, the pupils' um, responses. Um, and, uh, and in fact, this was my, my teaching episode because it was my first cycle, um, but I collected the responses and then we explored um, some of the relationships that the pupils noticed. So the questions were, you know, do you see any patterns? Um, what, what, what relationships can you find? And then together we co-constructed um, the generalization that we had in our minds um, uh, when we were in the before lesson um, uh, in the before lesson discussion. And from that, um, uh, something that was, was critical for me in terms of the research literature um, was to ensure that the pupils also had an opportunity to generate new examples from this um, uh, co-constructed generalization as well as an indicator of, of whether the pupils were making sense of the, um, the learning. Um, so we then had a post lesson discussion um, about what we saw, and as you can see there, the flip chart uh, remained in view of the teachers, the children went back to class, um, and there were two parts to our conversation, one was for the teachers to reflect on what they'd observed, and that was informed by, um, I'm sorry about the size of the, uh, of, of, of the writing, but obviously that's a, a handwritten um, uh, a sheet. Um, but uh, everybody had this, um, uh, this, this sheet that they were recording onto, and then that would inform their, their own um, uh, reflections. And it was structured around the quaternary analysis that I mentioned previously, focusing on the key point, difficult point, critical point. Um, and then our discussion was on the learning effect. And then for that discussion, we decided what we were going to change and why, what we would um, vary, what we wanted to keep invariant, and discussions around that led to us um, thinking about the difficult points that have been experienced. And in this particular case, we saw people struggling to apply a process that they didn't really understand. So a sort of invert and multiply, but it wasn't quite working correctly for them. Um, and using quiz and air rods as being an issue, um, uh, the children weren't familiar with them and they struggled to understand them. And then there was this idea that there was this between equation two and equation three, we had two fifths and four fifths. And this idea of doubling, um, one of the teachers observing felt that that was um, acting as a distractor. And so that was eliminated from the second iteration. So we then created our new sequence. And as you can see there, four fifths was changed to three fifths to eliminate this uh, doubling distractor that um, we had been discussing. So we then went on to teach the second uh, iteration. This time, this was taught by Rob. Um, again, just um, uh, 27 minutes uh, long, slightly longer than the previous one. Um, similar sort of structure to the lesson. So collecting pupils' answers um, after having observed what's the same and what's different, um, and then looking for relationships, co-constructing the generalization, and then generating new examples um, from the, the co-constructed generalization. And so we then went on to the, the next post-lesson discussion, which was uh, uh, just about 10 minutes long, 
Um, and again, our, our goal being do what do we keep saying? What do we change? Um, and this time, the difficult points that we um, identified were, um, again, applying a process, but it was a different uh, process that the pupils were using on this occasion, which was really interesting. Um, and uh, the group of children that we were working with for the second cycle also struggled with why, uh, how they understood dividing by three. Um, and again, using the Cuisinaire when it was used and how it was used um, was, was a point of discussion. So they recreated um, cycle three. Sorry, I, I should say something here about why, um, uh, why we changed what we did. So you, you can see we actually kept the, the, the equations the same, but changed the order. And that was um, because what we wanted to do, sorry, I've, I've, I've realized that equation two is incorrect and that should be a three there. <clears throat> um, so that's, that's a mistake in the graphic. So the idea being that they, um, that they wanted to um, shift the focus of dividing by three um, uh, more precisely uh, uh, further up through the, um, the, the teaching sequence. Um, so here we do a divide by two, then we do a divide by three, as that should be, um, and then two thirds, which was originally equation one, had been moved down to um, uh, e equation three. So similar structure again, but this time a decision was also taken about using a, a pictorial representation to support um, the learning of dividing by two and dividing by three. Um, so you can see that's something slightly different there. Um, looking for the relationships again between the different um, critical features, um, co-constructing the um, generalization, and then generating um, their own examples from um, the co-constructed uh, generalization. Um, the, the children's recorded examples were, were written on a separate piece of paper on this occasion. Um, so our final discussion, you can see, which is right at the end, we were actually squeezed for time because we spent a lot of time on the before lesson discussion, um, which wasn't an issue for future lesson studies, but because it had been the first one, it, it did take a lot longer. Um, so um, what we, we found was that it was it, it was very quick and probably not as meaningful as it as it, it should have been for the very final um, uh, lesson uh, uh, post lesson discussion. Um, and that particular difficult point that we saw here was that um, in moving the equations around and resequencing them, we ended up with two um, equations, both arriving at the answer of one fifth and this um, risk of um, overgeneralizing that third equation would also be one fifth um, uh, where the children weren't getting a, a full understanding of what was going on with the equations. So that was a real insight for the teachers was that although we'd use the same equations and that we'd put them in a different order, it, it gave us a new difficult point um, and a, a different experience for the learners. Um, so the teachers were then asked to reflect on the overall lesson study. Um, they completed an evaluation sheet as well as um, reflecting on their lens sheet. Um, and uh, that gave them that sort of sense. It gave me a bit of a sense about what they, they were thinking about as an outcome. So we can see here about the order of equations. Um, some teachers found it beneficial to be able to have the, the agency to change the equations and, and see the effect. Um, Okay, so um, as a model for micro teaching lesson study, I just want to sort of very quickly present some of the, the, the benefits and challenges. So I think on reflection, it, it was a really welcomed approach because it valued the act of practicing, the craft of teaching, which teachers don't usually have the opportunity to do. Um, we plan a lesson, we go in, we teach it live, and then the next day we teach the next lesson. What we don't get to do as, as primary teachers is to have a go at teaching the same thing over and over again until we can get it a little bit more precise and, and, and the benefits for the pupils are improved. Um, the role of the expert um, was attention for me. Um, uh, I had to sort of balance out making assumptions about what the teachers understood versus the clarity of my um, instructions um, about um, how, uh, how they contributed to the lesson study. Um, I also needed to balance out this idea of being a collaborator versus influencing the decisions that the teachers were making. And that, that changed over the course of the three lesson studies as the teachers gained more experience 
students and then also took greater um, ownership of the, the direction of the discussions. Um, and also um, that, that sort of tension of, against around leading the professional learning um, and sort of guiding the, and directing the, the pace of the lesson study um, and what we were focusing on um, and, and, and versus the sort of listening to, to what participants um, had to say and not being overpowering um, in the post-lesson discussion. I did feel as though the post-lesson discussion is probably compromised compared with other lesson types of lesson study. Uh, and that would be something to explore. Um, I, I hopefully I'm going to see over the three lesson studies a, a, a change in the quality of the post-lesson discussion um, that, that shows an improvement in that quality, but not that I'm measuring the quality in any particular way. So uh, I'll have to think about how I'm, I'm, I'm reflecting on that. And the expectations of the participants, you know, how, how I wanted the teacher to experience the fact that they were allowed to make changes to this, that it wasn't about what I felt was the right thing to do. It was about them using their observations and having, um, uh, having that agency within that community. And, and that needed some work. Uh, and finally, the timing to the session elements. Uh, two and a half hours was a bit of a squeeze, but three hours, I think, would be, make it much more possible um, to, to achieve. Um, there's a load of references which you won't be able to read there, but I'll make sure that, that the uh, slides are made available for you. So thank you. I'm sorry I've spoken for much longer than I expected to, and I, I hope that some of you may have time. I'm happy to stay on a little bit longer.